yeah hi this is gautam and uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, text on history and it is by one of the most renowned authors eric hobsbawm so our discussion will be about uh, the book the age of empire and if you look at the year which is presented right here it's between uh, talks about the history which is between 1875 and uh, 1914 you know Eric Hobsbawm doesn't actually require an introduction. He's not just considered a British historian, but possibly one of the leading historians who lived in the 20th century. And uh, he has written so many books. And, uh, you know, this book, Age of Empire, is uh, one in his entire series on modern history, which talks about uh, the lengthy 19th century. You know, before we start with the actual review, you know, certain historical books usually fall for some sort of fallacy. Thing is, when you usually talk about history, you want to write something about it, there is a trap that history becomes too associated or too joined with time as such. Like, you really focus too much on narration. For example, when did the king wake up? What happened at the age of 15? What happened at the age of 35? And this is how it, he exactly died. You know, but in certain history books, you really see the author trying to take you through multiple perspectives and dimensions uh, to make you feel why this uh, time period or the, you know, what do you call, or the person whom we are discussing is extremely important. For example, you look at this time period which they talk about here, uh, they are talking about this one. It's between 1875 and 1914. So it you know, when you hear the time period between 1875 and 1914, it may not really sound uh, that interesting because we have this, you know, what do you call, this interest for World War, like you say something like this is the time period for World War One, 1914 to 1918, 19, or this is a time period for World War Two, 1939 to 1945, you might very well be interested. But looking at 1875 to 1914 doesn't doesn't really interest you at the first instant but if you look deeply the author presents uh, or you know he tries to address it through multiple dimension which makes it so wonderful for example he asks many crucial questions you know in the year 1875 what does it really make a country modern like how do you classify something called as a developed world with a developing world like can you take something like okay if it is having million plus cities then you can call it as a more a developed world well that is not the case you take something like london yes london was a massive city but same you can say for mumbai also mumbai was equally you know if not equally it was one of the biggest uh, financial centers in the Indian subcontinent in 1875 talking of British trade. The railways were laid in the, in the 1850s between Mumbai and Thane, the first railway network in India. So how do you really classify something as a developed world and a developing world to really draw that, you know, what do you call the line between uh, two different entities. So that is beautifully addressed by the author. So what makes something is developed and developing? And uh, to really understand the time between the time period which you're talking about uh, you really need to appreciate what are the things which came up for example uh, telephones uh, machines uh, turbines these terminologies were not really well versed or used you take the time period which was even before that but these things become part of your daily lives you do not have something called as a telephone then you bring something called as a telephone in your day-to-day -day life then how does it actually affect the way people communicate the way culture is getting modified and all those factors that is he slowly presents a picture on how you know different entities are becoming part of modern life and how it is slowly changing people's lives and uh, you and i believe that most of you know that this is the time period the 1875 1914 especially a subset between 1880s and 1900 the entire african continent except for ethiopia get gets carved up so you hardly have 10 to 15 european nations controlling most parts of the world you can leave the likes of china or japan or russia russia outside the control but apart from that 
you know, you can call Russia as a Eurasian empire. Apart from that, it is mostly European countries who try to dominate the world in terms of territorial extent at the end of uh, 1900, which makes this time period again very interesting. You know, what else you find this, uh, you know, what else or how can you make it even more fascinating? What else is interesting? You ask me, all the political ideologies which you see are, you know, very easily spoken today, takes you know takes their uh, what do you call take their final form or at least the initial form in this stage let's take liberalism for example you use the word liberal in the 21st century right now people get confused you do not know whether the individual is talking about economic liberalism is he really talking about political liberalism so on and so forth the author talks about this problem in the 21st century being already present when the ideas actually have their genesis in the late 19th century itself, there is no proper clarity. Like if you mean liberalism, do you really mean political liberalism or economic liberalism? Where do you draw the line? To make it more interesting, it talks about democracy. You take this time period, this is the time in which democracy slowly begins to shape up. In many countries, you see it being you know, being acceptable form of government and slowly you have your empires getting declined and more and more people's participation getting, you know, involved in governance. Now, clarity here. When you say more people's participation, if you note carefully, again, these 50 years, is again these 40 years is again the time period in which you have large scale of workers getting literature and slowly they being driven towards the ideas of socialism and communism. This is a golden age of socialism. If you think about not just Karl Marx, you can take Max Weber, all their ideas, you know, slowly getting disseminated with the public with more and more printing of books. So the way you have these ideas spreading together among people makes a total difference on the idea of democracy itself. If you say the concept of democracy, which means you give people more power, like they are the ones who needs to elect the representatives. In that sense, if more and more workers join, what happens to the power of the bourgeois or what happens to the power of the middle class or the rich or the inventors? Does it get affected? So this political struggle between the bourgeois and the workers is handled really well. And Eric Hobsbawm tries to you know, what he call use a scalpel and dissect even harsh questions. You know, we are generally told a simplistic story when it comes to, you know, the struggle between industrialists and workers. But he identifies that even among workers, there are different uh, classes. For example, you, you know, there is a small translation of a poem, a, a German poem. I just read it for you. How you have this difference between workers? It says, uh, Bakers can bake their bread alone, joiners can do their work at home, but whenever miners stand, mates brave and true must be at hand. So you see that even though there are distinction, you know, workers consider themselves as one single entity, miners consider themselves to be superior compared to other form of workers because they see more uh, hard toil compared to the others. And even within the same country, there is problem between the indigenous workers and migrant workers. Okay, why do you have migrant workers in the same place? Think about India. People are forced or, you know, coerced by the colonial governments to move through different parts of the world because once you take a migrant out, he's cheap labor. You can, you know, you make indentured laborers. That's how large number of Indians were first fully moved out of India to South Africa, to Mauritius, to Mauritius, to Southeast Asia and many other places. And that is one example of, you know, the trouble between workers themselves. So that poem really talked about it. And he, you also see the concept of something called as nationalism, the idea of nations shaping up really well. So how do you, you know, encourage nationalism? You see government actively taking efforts. Before 1875 or 1870 for that matter, you really do not have government taking measures for promoting a singular language. Let me put it this way. German reunification or the concept called as Germany properly establishes in the year 1871 after the efforts of Otto von Bismarck. Now once Bismarck establishes it, you don't have the concept of Prussia and then German speaking states. You have a country called as Germany. Now in Germany, you will have different set of people speaking different languages. There is more and more linguistic diversity. If you want to promote the idea of nationalism, then you want to associate a single nation with a single language. That's how it usually happens. So you associate with a language and if you want to promote a singular language, 
you need government running schools you need government running all those services so you see that there is rise in school education rise in appointment of teachers and that is closely related with government and leaders themselves trying to promote the idea of nationalism if the political left were able to identify themselves with workers on a large scale. The political right find their solace in the idea of nationalism. So you'd have these two ideologies shaping up properly or getting segregated in these uh, in this time period, which you look at the time, it's usually not that glamorous. And uh, one important factor or domain which you really sees to tell you how this is an age of transition or transformation is look at the lives of women. Before 1875, you do not have large-scale participation of women in the workforce. But with 1875, the more spread of literacy, women participate in the workforce. You know, even though it is 21st century, today you have the problem of division of labor between man and women. I'm not talking about the labor world, I'm talking about within the household. So this problem starts in the late 19th century itself in Europe. Now, if a woman is going to take go, go to work, you clearly see that she's not paid as much as much as the man because they say that, you know what, you're not going to take care much of the entire family's income. It is after all the man. So the division starts in late 19th century itself, which we are not able to solve till today. And you also see that the household chores are not properly divided between man and women. Okay, and he also talk about talks about how the attire which women wear slowly changes over a period of time. They are there is more liberal ideas, the uh, stringency or what you call the strict uh, impositions or the dress code which they are supposed to follow slowly kind of you know it it doesn't disappear altogether, but you have restrictions popping up here and there, and that he's closely linking to the you know origin of the fashion industry how things change how the advert advertisement industry begins to use uh, women so you have so many dimensions being sprinkled across you know by this historian you also see how arts is getting transformed the idea of modernism uh, you have literature getting transformed you have painting getting transformed the same to do with architecture now the author analyzes why should art get transformed and why do we have the birth of modernism it's very simple now art is not something to be catered to the tastes of the elite or the middle class alone now we have a huge class of workers which means art cannot be elitist art will have to please or it has to find the connect with the common man so you take literature for example you take paintings for example it is becoming more and more related to the common man where everything try everyone tries to find a sense of appreciation and that is closely related to the evolution of modern cinema because that is the time when you have uh, these silent movies you slowly have the gramophone getting uh, invented as part of music industry and then slowly cinemas uh, foundation the motion pictures foundation being slowly laid here which picks up after 1914 and he also talks about uh, the evolutions in science you know there is a very small line which talks about it how how fascinating was this period when it comes to science uh, it may be pure accident or arbitrary selection that Planck's quantum theory the rediscovery of Mendel genetics Husserl's logice authorization Freud's interpretation of dreams and Cezanne's still life with origins can all be dated 1900. It would be equally possible to open the new century with Oswald's inorganic chemistry, Puccini's Tosca and Rostan's Lyagen. But the coincidence of dramatic innovation in several fields remains striking. So not just the fields of physics, but you take biology, you take, you, for example, Darwinism properly getting cemented, you take sociology, you know, Darwinism influencing sociology and anthropology as social Darwinism, physics, quantum mechanic exploring. So, so all those foundations are getting laid in the century, in this uh, for 40 year time period, which is quite fascinating. And you think about it in terms of uh, political history. It is also the time for the weakening and eventually end of empires. You see the Ottoman Empire struggling. The same is to be said for the Russians and the Chinese Empire. And by 1914, when compared to the Western European powers, their strength is markedly reduced. And as you clearly know, 1914 is the time in which the First World War starts. And the author devotes one single chapter on who can be really held responsible or what are the causative factors 
before the break of the outbreak of World War One. So if you are interested in history, especially 19th century history, this is definitely a go to book and you should read it no matter what. It's definitely a starting point. But if you're planning to read this book, I would recommend something else. Thing is, three books form part of the 19th century historian series. So the three books include this. The Age of uh, Revolution, starting from 1789 to 1848. Then you have the Age of Capital, the explosion of capitalism and how it gets really a part of both political and economic philosophy from 1848 to 1875. And finally, the Age of Empire. So when it comes to the 19th century history, these three books will provide a solid foundation and a comprehensive understanding of what the century exactly means and uh, how the foundation for the, you can say the domination of Homo sapiens is late in 20th and the early 21st century. So it is a trilogy to be read and cherished. Thank you.